tierra del fuego. Greetings. Welcome to Wiki Surfer, a kind of experiment in podcast storytelling. Basically, the format is this. Two guys, Brandon Fibbs and Kyle Sullivan, will each pick the starting topic on Wikipedia, crack it open, and see what hides inside. Moving purely on curiosity, hopping from hyperlink to hyperlink, they pick the best, weirdest, and most wonderful stories possible. Happy surfing! So, Kyle, have you ever heard of Project Habakkuk? I, I can't say that I have. It's a completely new term to me. Excellent. Well then, let me ask you another question. If I were to charge you, Kyle Sullivan, with creating a new naval vessel made out of an all-new material that could withstand the impact of an exploding torpedo, where would your mind go? Uh, I don't know. Car- carbonite? Uh, adamantium's fake. Um, vibranium. Wakanda forever. So those are good, but I have you beat. Basically, and I am not making this up, Project Habakkuk was a plan by the Allies in World War II to construct an aircraft carrier made, wait for it, entirely out of ice. Technically not just ice, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. The year is 1942. The world is at war. Britain is on food rations, and Prime Minister Winston Churchill is concerned that mass starvations are just one catastrophe away. Each week, Allied convoys in the Atlantic attempt to dodge German U-boats so they can deliver tons of badly needed food. The problem is that they're getting picked off and sunk in huge numbers. Near to the shore, ships can be protected by sub-hunting aircraft, which was, by the way, my job when I was in the Navy. But in the middle of the ocean, they are sitting ducks. And food isn't the only thing they're running short of. The British are running low on steel and aluminum, or aluminium, as the Brits would say. So Lord Mountbatten, who, if you've been watching The Crown, is Philip's kindly uncle, he was chief of combined operations for the British Navy, and he was tasked with coming up with a creative technology to turn the tide of the war. He encouraged the scientists and the engineers under him to submit ideas, no matter how outlandish. One such man was Geoffrey Pike, an inventor with a colorful past. He's been everything from a newspaper war correspondent to a covert spy master. And in World War I, he was a prisoner of war who escaped his captors and literally walked out of Germany. So Pike's idea went something like this. Huge icebergs float, so why not hollow out an iceberg to hold a bunch of planes and level it off at top so they can take off and land? The problem is, of course, Icebergs have a way of rolling over, which would be a really bad thing for anyone inside of one. So Pike settled on a ship made of ice instead. Plus, if this ship received any damage, all you had to do was pour water into the damaged areas and refreeze it. Presto, good as new. And because they're made of ice, these vessels would be cheap, easy, and fast to make. A couple of these ice ships, strategically placed around the Atlantic, would mean that vulnerable merchant ships would never be without air support. Pike called the project Habakkuk. Project Habakkuk. Named after the Old Testament prophet in the Bible who said, Look at the nations and watch, and be utterly amazed, for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe. But Pike had a problem. Ice cracks and splits, so he had to come up with some kind of bonding agent. A couple of American scientists put their heads together and came up with a compound made out of seawater and paper pulp, pretty much sawdust, which was 14 times stronger than regular ice and tougher than concrete. In honor of Jeffrey Pike, they called it Pikrete. So the story goes that Lord Mountbatten arrived at number 10 Downing Street one day and caught Churchill in the bath. But rather than waiting, he barged into the bathroom and dropped a chunk of Pikrete into the tub It took so long for the ice to melt in the steaming hot water that Churchill approved Project Habakkuk on the spot. Soon, blueprints were drafted for a massive aircraft carrier with a crew complement of thousands of men and hundreds of aircraft. To put that in perspective, modern carriers can accommodate uh, about 80 or so aircraft at one time. But how do you test? 
test something like this. So the first extremely small scale experiments were carried out in a secret basement location underneath a meat market in London, inside of a refrigerated locker behind a protective screen of frozen animal carcasses. And everything seemed to work. The results were encouraging and they decided it was time to scale up. In 1943, the British Navy decided to build a scale prototype vessel, 60 feet long and 30 feet wide, on Patricia Lake, deep inside Jasper National Park in Alberta, Canada, because the location was remote, frigid, had lots of forest land for wood, and could easily be supplied by the Canadian Railway. Project Habakkuk employed several teams of conscientious objectors, working in isolation from one another, and they hadn't the slightest clue what they were building. However, things began to go wrong almost immediately. While Pycrete is amazing stuff, it wasn't supernatural, and given enough time, it was still melting and deforming. That meant more steel reinforcement and a massive cooling system would be needed, consisting of thousands of miles of steel tubing, of circular refrigerant, and that sort of thing. So this pretty much turned the HMS Habakkuk into one giant refrigerator. And suddenly the project was far more complicated than originally anticipated, and several orders of magnitude more expensive. But the real difficulty was where to find all that steel. There was only one place that had enough, the United States of America. And so Lord Mountbatten flew to a secret meeting to convince the American military to come on board. But they were skeptical of the cockamamie plan. Desperate to gain their support, Mountbatten hastily took out a block of ice and a block of pycrete, took out his revolver and shot them both. The normal ice exploded into a thousand pieces, but the bullet didn't come close to penetrating the pikery. Instead, it ricocheted off, hit one of the onlookers in the leg before embedding itself in the wall. Eh, the Americans gave it a thumbs up on the spot. As the engineers and builders at Patricia Lake got to work, the Royal Navy began adding several problematic requirements. The vessel would now have to have a range of 7,000 miles. It would have to have a hull at least 40 feet thick to make it impervious to attack. And it would have to be able to accommodate not just fighters, but larger heavy bombers as well. Meaning the final ship would have to be more than 2,000 feet long. The HMS Habakkuk was going to be massive, displacing more than two metric tons of water. Its rudder would have to be more than 100 feet tall, and it would never be able to attain any speeds faster than six knots. The steel needed to construct just the refrigeration plant would be greater than that needed to build an entire traditional aircraft carrier. Additionally, hundreds of thousands of tons of wood pulp would be necessary, crippling paper production and requiring a small army not just to harvest it, but also to process it. And while the original cost was projected at around $700,000 per ship, it quickly swelled to now $6 million a ship. A single ice vessel was going to cost more money and machinery than a whole fleet of conventional aircraft carriers. Turns out quite a few of the engineers had done some back of the envelope math and figured this out pretty early on, but everyone was so scared of Churchill that they kept quiet. Lucky for the Allies, the Battle of the Atlantic had turned in their favor. Portugal had begun making its airfields available, giving land-based aircraft far greater ranges, and German submarines were being sunk faster than they could be replaced. The Habakkuk was no longer necessary. In December of 1943, it was decided to scuttle the prototype in Patricia Lake, just let it melt, which is what happened, technically. It just took three years for the ship to fully melt. In the 1970s, scuba divers discovered the ship's remains, wooden planks from the hull, as well as a jumble of refrigeration ductwork, bringing the top secret project into the light. Today, an underwater plaque at the bottom of the lake commemorates Pike's crazy idea. After the war, Pike himself fell into a deep depression. He kept coming up with these wildly original ideas to help rebuild war-devastated Europe, but each one was rejected, and he was widely mocked in the media. On the evening of February 21st, 1948, Pike consumed a bottle of sleeping pills, taking his own life. The Times of London wrote an obituary in which they praised him as, quote, one of the most original, if unrecognized, figures of the present century. That is crazy. Uh, what? Okay, so starting out, it sounds ridiculous. The thought of ice ships, it, it just sounds ridiculous. 
But is it so far-fetched? We make ships out of wood. And as the story built, I, I, you know, it, it gained, I mean, I started to believe it. Uh, and, you know, another thing to think about is how World War II is just this insane cauldron of weird ideas and exciting stories. And there's a lot of off-the-beaten-path kind of stuff that's happening on the corners of the war. And it just, do we know of anywhere in any kind of media, art, movie, whatever, where someone has tried to depict this ship? There are certainly drawings and schematics that are online that you can see that depict the ship, what it would it would have looked looked like. Um, some of them are more fanciful, some of them are more technical. But I haven't seen any documentaries, and I certainly haven't seen uh, seen anything depicted in like narrative film or anything like that. Well, that was a good that's a good find. That was a really uh, that's a really interesting weird corner of World War II. I'm glad I heard that. What do you have for us? <clears throat> so. In starting this particular surf, uh, I wanted to put my feet squarely on the surfboard with a question. Why aren't there any penguins in the Northern Hemisphere? Let me provide a little context. Penguins are birds that live primarily in the Southern Hemisphere. There are between 17 and 20 living species, depending on how you divide them up, and they dwell in various places from Antarctica all the way up to the Galapagos Islands, just north of the equator. That would be the Galapagos penguin that lives there, the second smallest penguin species in the world. But why not the north? The most famous penguin species, like that of the Adelie penguins or the emperor penguins, live in the snow and ice of Antarctica. And that's the kind of environment we imagine all penguins live in, although truthfully, most live in more temperate places. But why haven't they migrated further than Galapagos? The extreme northern hemisphere can be just as cold as Antarctica on a good day. And many ocean-dwelling creatures have a global dispersion. You can find varieties of seagulls and whales and seals and albatrosses all over the place. So why not penguins? In looking at this question, I bumped into a creature called the Great Auk. The Great Auk. A species of bird that went extinct in the 19th century. And this opened up a whole bag of stuff that I, frankly, didn't know anything about. Like, for example... The word penguin was what the Great Auk was called by early European explorers moving around in the North Atlantic Ocean. When European explorers later made it into the waters of the Southern Hemisphere, they thought that what we know as penguins today looked like what they knew as penguins then, specifically this now extinct Great Auk. I want to talk about the Great Auk a little bit and take a look at this idea of what European explorers were finding in the Americas in terms of natural splendor, But I want to make a quick pit stop with the word penguin, because people who study languages are apparently having a hard time figuring out where this word comes from. And I find that interesting. The word penguin, it came into use around the 16th century through an unknown linguistic source. In the past, some have attributed the source to the Latin word pingus, pinguis, which I know I'm mispronouncing. Uh, This word means fat. Uh, This led to the coining of words in German and Dutch. Uh, Fetgens. Fetgens. Vetgens. Fetgens. Which literally translates to fat goose. So this origin story is tempting because, you know, most European languages and cultures like to attribute themselves a Latin or Roman origin of some stripe, even when it's not merited. But the most plausible explanation for the origin of the word is probably from the Welsh language. In the 1570s, Sir Francis Drake, sailing for England on a ship called the Golden Hind in the Magellan Strait at the bottom tip of South America, made reference to penguins in the modern sense of how we know them today. Quote, Infinite were the numbers of the Fule, which the Welshmen named penguin, and Maglanus turned them geese. Drake and his crew had found actual penguins down there, probably the Magellanic penguin or the Humboldt penguin. However, it is clear that he is borrowing the term that was used for the great auk. You may be wondering how close this great auk resembles actual penguins. Well, the auk was a large, black-and-white, flightless seabird. At a distance, you might probably think you were seeing a penguin, so pretty close. In using the Welsh penguin, P-E-N-G-W-Y-N, Penguin. Drake and company weren't just making up a word out of thin air. They were pulling it from a known source. In the Welsh language, the closest translation we can get is white head. 
Pen, P-E-N, translates as white, and Gwen, G-W-Y-N, translates as head. Except that combining these Welsh words together gives us another problem. In an article on the Oxford University Press blog, Anatoly Lieberman notes that the Welsh word for head is in fact Gwen, G-W-Y-N, but that in a compound word, the G would be dropped, leaving us with penwen, P-E-N-W-Y-N. But that's not how the word is being used. Instead, the G is being kept in, penguin, P-E-N-G-W-Y-N. So if the Welsh translation is somewhat incorrect, then what is, what is happening here? In the same Oxford Press blog article, Lieberman brings attention to the work of linguist William Sayers, who suggests that the origin of our modern penguin might be a word in Breton, uh, a Celtic language. The word being penguin, two words, P-E-N-N, and then G-W-Y-N-N. Penguin. It's very nearly the same as the version in Welsh, but it might not refer to a bird. Instead, it might refer to a place, not a white head, but a white headland. The Breton penguin might refer to an island where great auks were nesting. A rookery such as that will be colored white due to the guano that is associated with such places. An established colony would have centuries of white guano piled up. Sayers theorizes that this island would have been along a developing trade route from Europe to Newfoundland that would eventually be sailed by hundreds of French, Spanish, and English ships, inviting an eventual corruption of the original place name word and an association with the place name and the bird the Great Auk. As it happens, there is a Whitehead Island in Newfoundland. But no one has really figured it out yet. Several linguists have taken a crack at it, but currently it is a mystery buried in time, waiting for another clue to be uncovered. And at the center of it is the Great Auk, which is now very much extinct. This flightless bird stood about two and a half feet tall, weighed about 10 pounds, and while nesting in only a few large colonies, would roam across the North Atlantic from Canada all the way to northern Spain. They were very much like certain species of modern penguins. They congregated in large social colonies, breeding pairs mated for life, and produced a single egg per season. People living uh, along the coast of Newfoundland, Canada, during the late Archaic period, roughly 8,000 to 1,000 BCE, uh, they sometimes buried people with the bones of a great auk. One particularly interesting burial from this period includes more than 200 great auk beaks in one burial spot, which might have been part of a cloak or a garment of some kind. The Beothuk people made a kind of great auk egg pudding. Europeans love the bird's down feathers for use in pillows, and, as per human custom, hunted whole populations to extinction over it. In a fascinating and unexpected find for me, I read that some of the earliest laws meant for protecting wildlife were passed because of the Great Auk. The first official protection was issued in 1553, if you can imagine it, only 60 years after Europeans finally stumbled into the Americas. They were passing laws to protect a flightless bird. In St. John's, Newfoundland, a 1775 law punished those who hunted the auk for feathers or eggs with flogging. By the 1840s, Interested parties sought to collect great auk samples before the species vanished. Its rarity increased demand for the bird as a commodity, which fueled even more hunting and some surprising cruelty. An account by Aaron Thomas of the HMS Boston described the inhumane practices of harvesting the bird, including plucking and skinning and cooking the birds alive. In 1840, on an island called, and of course I'm going to mispronounce this, Stack an Armin? Stack an Armin an island in the St. Kilda group, along the outer reaches of eastern Scotland. This is the place where the Great Auk was last seen for Britain. Three men caught a single bird and tied it up for three days until a storm came. Thinking that the bird was a witch who summoned the storm, the men beat the bird to death. An artist later painted a depiction of the scene in a a piece of art called The Witch of St. Kilda. It is a sad, sad little testimony to a bird. The last colony of great auks held refuge at an island called Eldi. Eldi. It's an uncomfortable, pitiful-looking island. There, collectors came to take specimens for preservation and study, 
until there was only a single breeding pair left. And unlike the demise of a great many species that have left this world, this extinction comes down to a single documented event. Two men were there at the end. In an interview, one of the men described what happened. They walked slowly. John gripped up with his arms open. The word that John got went into a corner, but mine was going to the edge of the cliff. It walked like a man, but moved its feet quickly. I caught it close to the edge, a precipice many fathoms deep. Its wings lay close to the sides, not hanging out. I took him by the neck, and he flapped his wings. He made no cry. I strangled him. That was 1844, and it's definitely a sad moment. And although there were one or two supposed sightings after the state, no one could really confirm them. Today, over 70 great ox skins remain. Over 70-something eggs and 24 skeletons are preserved. In an unfortunate twist of fate, however, the skins of those last two great ox are still missing. Their whereabouts have been unknown for over a century. And surviving specimens are now more valuable than ever. The Icelandic Museum of Natural History bought a specimen for 9,000 pounds. The most expensive stuffed bird ever sold, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. The Great Auk lives on in literature, on stage, and as mascots for both an academy in Delaware and the Adelaide University Choral Society in Australia. It's a complete bummer of a story, I know, but it... It is a fascinating look at economics and cruelty of extinction and humanity's place in the natural order. Several books have been written on the topic of the Great Auk, and because of this dive into the material, I'm thinking about putting a few on my reading list. But in terms of my wiki surfing, I found myself rather curious about that moment of European discovery in the Straits of Magellan, where Drake and his crew first described what we know now as penguins. I'm curious as to which species they saw there, and how many species live in that part of the world. Tierra de Fuego translates to the land of fire. How and why that name came about, especially in a place that is comparatively fairly chilly, this is something I want to return to. I I just don't understand the, the thrill that some people get from taking the life of an animal. Whether it's hunting uh, and then standing beside some beautiful creature and saying, look how beautiful this creature was. Well, then why did you kill it? I just, I, th- that baffles me. I, I can't access that sort of like that part of other people's humanity. And I certainly can't access people who would go to an island, find an animal they know is on the brink of extinction, and then just because they could, kill it. Well, for my next surf... I'm going to select a subject that you probably didn't even hear me mention before because it had so little bearing on our discussion. I'm going to discuss the Canadian Pacific Railway. Canadian Pacific Railway. And if you've spent any time in Canada, you know that it is massive. Canada is larger than the United States. It is larger than China. In fact, it is the world's second largest country in total area behind only Russia. If you want to quibble, Antarctica is larger. But since no country can claim Antarctica, Canada wins. Now, granted, no one can live in vast amounts of it. Half of Canada's 36 million people live below an imaginary line drawn pretty much anywhere on the northern American border. But all that's beside the point. We are here to talk about how big it is and how they linked it from sea to shining sea. So in 1867, four provinces, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Quebec, and Ontario joined to form the new country of Canada. Three years later, Manitoba and the Northwest Territories joined, and at that time, British Columbia was a sovereign entity. But in 1871, it said it would join, but only if the Canadian government promised to build a transcontinental railway, linking both ends of the country within the next 10 years. Sir John Macdonald, Canada's first prime minister, agreed, even though many of his contemporaries thought a project of that scope was simply beyond human ability. Right out of the gate, things went south. Private financiers hired to build the railway bribed government officials, a scandal of such proportions that MacDonald and his conservative government were booted from power. 
The new liberal government was uninterested in keeping McDonald's promise, and they shelved the project. And it wasn't until 1878, when McDonald was re-elected prime minister, that planning for the Canadian Pacific Railway, or the CPR, began again in earnest. Starting in 1881, 30,000 workers, the majority of them Chinese, were paid $1.50 a day to build the track. By hand, these men managed to build about five miles of track a day. There were a lot of obstacles when they first set out. One was the fact that the train line would have to plow through land controlled by the Blackfoot First Nation. So the railroad sent a missionary priest into the territory to convince the natives that progress was inevitable, the train was coming no matter what, so you might as well just give in. Amazingly, the priest was successful, and in thanks, the Blackfoot chief, Crowfoot, was given a lifetime free pass to ride the train. But the main obstacle was a bit bigger, or technically taller, the Rocky Mountains. By the end of 1883, the railroad had reached the towering peaks. The Canadian Rockies of British Columbia were still largely unexplored at this time, and no one knew if there was even a route through them. An American surveyor by the name of Major Albert Bowman Rogers was promised a check for $5,000 and naming rights if he could find a pass. Rogers' experience was in surveying the American prairies of Illinois and Minnesota, not mountains. But despite being hated by his men for being such a tough taskmaster, he managed to find a route, on his birthday no less, two years after he began the search. Rogers got his check, and true to their word, the CPR named it Rogers Pass, the name it still has today. Rogers was so proud, by the way, of his accomplishment, he almost didn't cash the check. He framed it and put it on his wall for years. So Rogers Pass is known for its winter snowfall, which amounts to about 33 feet a year. Today, the area, which is in the heart of Glacier National Park, is huge for skiing and camping and hiking and mountain climbing. But at the time, it was a foreboding, freezing frontier. Workers had to contend with rugged terrain, avalanches, forest fires, hungry grizzly bears, and swarms of mosquitoes. On November 7th, 1885, the last spike was driven into the track, joining east and west. 12,500 miles, or if we're being Canadian, 20,000 kilometers of Canada's transcontinental railway stretching from Montreal in the east to Vancouver in the west was complete. It was the longest transcontinental railroad ever constructed at the time, and it was considered a staggering feat of engineering, especially when it was undertaken by so young and so small, population-wise, a country. And while it was primarily designed to haul freight, the CPR was the only practical means of long-distance passenger transport in most parts of Canada for decades. As such, it was instrumental in the settlement and development of Western Canada. Now then, I want to go back to the Rocky Mountains, since this is the, the entire reason I'm telling you the story. The area around Rogers Pass is insanely steep. The trains that eventually plied those mountains required special pusher locomotives just to help them get over the top of the Great Divide. Once they made it over, they had to descend a 4.5% gradient. That may not sound like a lot, but 4% was the maximum gradient allowed for railways in that era. And even today, modern railways rarely exceed a 2% gradient. The hope was that a speed limit for descending trains of about 6 miles an hour would be enough to keep them safe. It wasn't. The very first construction locomotive to make the trip derailed, fell, landed in a river below, and killed three people. In the coming years, trains met their ends on that particular descent with alarming regularity. To make matters worse, avalanches were very common in the winter, frequently covering or in some cases completely tearing out the tracks. In 1910, an avalanche swept a 91-ton locomotive right off the tracks, pulverized the wooden cars it was pulling, and killed all but one of the 62 people aboard. And... Forgive me for all of that backstory because this is what I've been leading to and I really hope it's not anticlimactic. A pair of spiral tunnels. I've been fascinated by these tunnels ever since I first encountered them on a visit to Vancouver several years ago. They are among the most bizarre and incredible feats of engineering I've ever come across. The railway had to find a way to slow the trains down, but the only way to do that was by flattening the gradient. But because of the steepness of the mountains, they didn't have room to make that work. So they burrowed into the mountain, creating two tunnels, an upper 
and a lower. The train enters the first tunnel, loops back over itself, going perpendicular to its original direction of travel. It does this twice, descending bit by imperceptible bit, almost forming a figure eight within the mountain before popping back out into the sunlight and continuing the proper direction down the mountainside. This allowed the engineers to make the train's descent much more gradual, and while it effectively doubled the length, adding several kilometers to the trip, it reduced the gradient from a vertigo-inducing 4.5% to a more manageable 2.2%, and also allowed fewer, smaller, less powerful locomotives to carry the same loads. It is really awesome, and they still use it. One of these days, I want to take a trip up there. And if you go to YouTube, you can watch the front of the train enter the tunnel and come out the other side, far below, going the opposite direction of travel as the caboose, which hasn't even made it into the tunnel yet. It is bonkers cool. Wow. Spiral tunnel. It's kind of like taking a staircase to a different floor, I guess, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's like a switchback, but it's a, it's a switchback that folds around itself into like these spirals and these figure eights. But the, the thought that people, especially at this time, more than 100 years ago, are burrowing into a mountain and doing all of this exquisite engineering and mathematics uh, to allow these trains to descend safely is, is amazing. And the tunnels are still used today. Still used today. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. <laughs> so, is this the first time a spiral tunnel had been deployed? No, there are, in fact, when I looked up spiral tunnels on Wikipedia, a number came up. They are all over the world. They are in the mountains of Switzerland and Germany and all over the place. So this was not, uh, this was something that people were well aware of. It's it's incredible. Like, just burrowing into a mountain by itself uh, blindly is impressive, but creating mathematically precise tunnels to to spiral through the mountain to drop from one level, like, a, what do they call that, a, a lock? Um Wow. Very, very cool uh, engineering thing you've, you've discovered, for real. Uh, shall we move along? Move along. Um, for my second surf, I wanted to go back to this moment of, and place of discovery aboard the HMS Golden Hind with Sir Francis Drake and his crew when they spotted what we now call penguins in the 1570s. Um, Tierra de Fuego, the land of fire, at the bottom of South America. This is where this happened at. This is where the Strait of Magellan is. Full disclosure, I, I've been down here before in real life uh, to a city called Ushuaia and its surroundings. It's astoundingly beautiful and eccentric. It's like some kind of upside-down fairy tale land. <laughs> but I know next to nothing about the history of the place, so now is my chance to rectify this, no? What is the Land of Fire really about? And more important to me, what kinds of penguins live down there? What are their lives like? And especially, how do people interact with them? Sir Francis Drake was not the first to enter the Strait of Magellan. That would be, naturally, Portuguese explorer Ferdinand Magellan, noted in history as one of the leaders of the first known circumnavigation of the Earth by sea. A mind-blowing and unbelievable tale if there ever was one. Um, spoiler alert, Magellan dies partway through the voyage. <clears throat> anyway, I digress. The Strait of Magellan separates mainland South America from a big collection of islands called the Land of Fire, which we regard as the very tip of South America on a map. Ships used to take this shortcut in order to avoid the more treacherous waters of the Drake Passage. In 1520, as he and his crew were sailing in the area, they saw a great many fires on shore. He thought they were the many fires of Indian encampments. The Yagan. The Yagan. The Manek Inc. The Manek Inc. And the Selknam. The Selknam. Were the native peoples who lived at the bottom of South America. In the strait, formerly called Draco Cola or Dragon's Tail, Magellan was probably seeing Yagan people. He felt there were so many fires, representing so many people, that his ships were vulnerable to ambush. So that's where Land of Fire comes from. During this portion of my surf, I came across a curious individual, a Yagan man named Orandelico. Orandelico. But before I speak about Orandelico, I first have to give the broadest of outlines about what happened to these native peoples in this part of the world. You see, they are almost all gone, practically. The genetics probably live on in a handful of modern people living in the area today, but the cultures behind these names are considered completely extinct. 
uh, the usual suspects are to blame. Encroaching Europeans, disease, warfare. It is a sad, sad tale. The Manek Inc. are thought to have died out culturally in the 1920s. The last full-blooded Selknam person, Angela Loige, I think that's pronounced, died in 1974. Christina Calderon, the last full-blooded Yagan person and speaker of the language, currently lives on Navarino Island in Chile, not too far from Ushuaia. If she is, in fact, still alive, then she would be 90 years old right now, the last of her kind. It is in the middle of this history of waves of depopulation that we come upon the story of Orandelico. Captain Robert Fitzroy, commanding the HMS Beagle, He's the guy who kidnapped Orandelico and three other Yagan people in 1830, presumably on grounds that one of Fitzroy's boats had been stolen. He took these hostages to England, feeding them and clothing them in the hopes of converting them to Christianity. He fed them with his officers and crew, in fact, and gave them European names. Um, sort of. Orandelico is called Jimmy Button because of what was used as payment for him, a mother-of-pearl button, the other Yagan people were given weird names as well. York Minster, Fuegia Basket, and Boat Memory. I kind of wish my name was Boat Memory. At any rate, Fitzroy took them to Britain, where they became something of celebrities. They even met King William IV and Queen Adelaide and were discussed in newspapers at the time. Funny enough, Queen Adelaide was the source of the name for the city of Adelaide in Australia, from which Adelaide University Choral Society gets its name, the group whose mascot is the great Auk. That was just a funny coincidence. Anyway, sorry, getting back to it. Boat Memory, one of the four taken by Fitzroy, died of smallpox while in England, but the other three got the chance to return home to Tierra de Fuego a year later with Captain Fitzroy on the HMS Beagle. Now... Voyage number two. <clears throat> voyage number two. You'll know with all... A, with a certain celebrity in the hold. A certain celebrity named Charles Darwin naturalist and proponent of the scientific theory of evolution by natural selection. So, Charles Darwin spent time with Oren Delico, which I thought was really cool. Again, the world gets smaller. Upon arriving home, Oren Delico shed his European cultural trappings and returned to his native dress. When offered a ride back to Britain months later, he refused. Charles Darwin himself conjectured that this was due to his, quote, young and nice-looking wife. That was in the early 1830s. Decades later, in 1858, British missionaries were active in the Tierra de Fuego region. They invited Orandelico to visit their base in the Falkland Islands. He did so. He brought his family and stayed for a few months before returning to his home on Navarino Island in the Land of Fire. Another group of nine native peoples that visited the missionaries after Orandelico did didn't fare as well. Cultural misunderstandings led to a series of disagreements and hard feelings. While returning to Navarino Island, an altercation broke out between the nine native people and the British crew of the ship. After they arrived back on Navarino Island, the natives murdered the entire British crew during a Sunday service on shore in Wulaya Bay, except for the ship's cook, who escaped with his life on a small boat. Orndelico would later go back to the Falklands and give testimony for an inquiry into this massacre. There is some indication that the British thought he might be involved, but Orndelico claims he wasn't and testified as such. Orndelico would die in 1863, only a few years after this incident. Another missionary, a man named Waite Sterling, would take one of Orndelico's sons, a person named Three Boy, to Britain. Presumably this wasn't a kidnapping like what had happened originally. What I find fascinating about this is not only that this is a somewhat obscure moment to us North Americans, perhaps, but that so much effort was spent contacting and converting these Patagonians to a new way of life, that a Yagan man traveled to Britain and became something of a celebrity, and now not only are all these participants now long dead, but the cultures involved are effectively extinct as well. It just gave me this weird feeling, you know, that life... Life is fleeting. Cultures are fleeting, too. It, it might not feel like it to us Americans. We are a huge culture, brimming with millions of people and flush with more riches and mobility than any culture that has come before it. But one day, maybe, there will not be a United States. Its culture will be extinct. 
Like the great Auk, our numbers will eventually dwindle down to a single individual. Perhaps an elderly lady living by herself in a small town at the edge of the world. Kind of makes one think. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. I came down this road, ultimately, to look at the penguins of the land of fire. I'm still interested in finding out how cultures deal with penguins, something I find interesting because there are no penguins interacting with the cultures that I live in. But however, before I continue any further, I need to check in uh, with you. This is a really great stopping point for me. Uh, how does this story strike you? You know, you've, you've now dealt with the extinction of an animal species, and you've dealt with the extinction of a human people group. Humans are really good at just screwing everybody, including themselves, over. You frequently, I, you know, I think about this kind of thing, and you hear people uh, mostly hyperbolically talking in, in our politically charged climate right now about, like, the end of America coming. And it's hard to think about something as large and as powerful as the United States of America ending. But if history is our guide, of course it will. It will either end or it will transmutate. You know, you and I, just this week, Kyle, um, were talking about the Roman Empire at the height of its powers. Um, and it, it controlled 40 nations, modern nations-wise. It was a fifth of the world's total population was lived within the Roman Empire. And you know, at the time, those guys thought they were too big to fail, to use a modern colloquialism. And of course, they weren't, and neither are we. That's just the way of the, it's the way of the world. Yeah, it's, I don't know, it's the place where this particular surf took me. You know, I kept reading about this guy, Jimmy Button. Just knowing the f what the future held for him, I found it really, it was, it was a melancholic kind of a, a read, you know. I think it's time to go on to something a little happier. What do you think? <laughs> I, think I think that's true. So, for my next surf, I'm going to talk about beavers. Beavers. The beaver is the official logo of the Canadian Pacific Railway. It's also Canada's national animal. So, you probably think this is going to be some sort of, like, beaver factoid segment in which I tell you all kinds of cool things about these large rodents, like the lips of a beaver are located behind its teeth so that it can close its mouth and not drown while carrying branches. Or, due to the fact that it lives in water, in the 17th century, the Catholic Church officially categorized the beaver as a kind of fish, making it edible on Good Friday and throughout Lent. Or... The beaver has glands under its tail that secrete a brown substance with the consistency of molasses and the scent of vanilla, which just happens to be an FDA-approved natural flavoring. Mm. Or, the largest dam in existence is located in Alberta and stretches for more than half a mile. Now, you might think I'm going to tell you cool facts like that, but I'm not. I'm going to tell you a story about a beaver named Geronimo. It's 1948. World War II has ended. The GIs are back home, rebuilding their lives, and are about to kick off the post-war economic boom. Some of these people are settling in a place called Pyatt Lake, Idaho, a gorgeous wooded area a little over two miles north of Boise that had for centuries been free of human beings. People started to build their homes around this lake, and they quickly ran into a problem. The lake was also home to a local beaver population, and the two weren't getting along. Go away! Beavers are responsible for about $100 million in property damage every year, and the residents of Pyatt Lake wanted them gone. Today, of course, homeowners are encouraged to get along with the wildlife, but at the time, transplantation was considered the only remedy. The Idaho Department of Fish and Game was tasked with tracking and rehoming the entire beaver population. And they knew where they wanted to put them, too. Chamberlain Basin, deep in the Sawtooth National Forest, where they would be as far away from humans as possible. The only problem is, Sawtooth was really isolated. There weren't even roads to get to where they needed to go. What do you do? Enter Elmo Heater, a fish and game employee. 
At first, Elmo considered carrying the beaver cages into the forest on mules, but he quickly found that beavers and mules don't mix. Something about the struggling, smelling little rodents really spooked the larger animals. Elmo had to come up with another plan, and that's when he hit on it. He proposed using surplus World War II parachutes to drop the beavers into the backcountry by plane. Elmo set out designing a willow cage for the beavers. His idea was that once they touched down, they would simply chew their way to freedom. But the beavers didn't like their cages, and they set to work gnawing through the cages the minute they were put in. And Elmo was worried that they might get out of the plane, or worse, chew their way out while they were in freefall. So the willow cage wouldn't work. Elmo came up with plan B, a specially designed wooden box that opens upon impact. He tested it with dummy weights, but quickly realized he'd need to test it with the real beaver before they put their plan into action. So he found an older male beaver to be his crash test dummy, and he threw him out of a perfectly good airplane again and again and again. Elmo named him Geronimo. Once Elmo was satisfied he had everything just right, he rewarded his furry test pilot by allowing him to be the very first beaver dropped into the Chamberlain Basin, accompanied, I might add, by three lovely fertile female beavers. Later, Elmo gathered up all the rest of the beavers, 76 in all, and dropped them into the basin as well. All but one survived, and they have been fruitful and multiplying ever since. They now live, in fact, in what is the largest protected roadless forest in the lower 48. Beaver story. Happy beaver story. It is a happy beaver story. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of taken with the similarity uh, between Geronimo the beaver and uh, Orindelico, how they've been, they were sort of kidnapped and whisked away to some grand experience, you know, and then released back into the wild. There, there might be a metaphor in there. <laughs> that is a really crazy, uh, crazy story, actually. Where would you like to take us next on your pursuit of penguins? Um, as I mentioned... The main drive of my surfing was to figure out why there aren't any penguins in the Northern Hemisphere. I think that this is simply answered, because they haven't gotten there yet. Uh, the oldest penguin fossil is only 62 million years old, and there are species already existing in ecological niches where the penguin might inhabit in the Northern Hemisphere, such species like the Great Auk. You can't move into an ecological niche if something is already, you know, living there. So, you know, they just, they just never went to the North. But in looking at this question, uh, I, you know, I, as previously mentioned, I came to the land of fire in South America and the history of what people have been doing down there. But this fueled an, another penguin-related question. How have people been interacting with penguins at the bottom of this continent? And how do they interact with them now? Patagonian penguin interactions. I, I was curious about this because there are several endemic penguin species that live down there among the Patagonians. So presumably there was a relationship uh, of some kind. So I began with the indigenous Patagonians, uh, but I could find no vocabulary or descriptions of penguin interactions. There are online dictionaries for the various languages of the region and perhaps one blog post about Yagan cultural depictions of penguins as mythological characters. The absolute best I could find was a literal photocopy of a page from Thomas Bridges' 19th century Yagan English Dictionary, a work that took Bridges a decade to create. Bridges is one of the previously mentioned missionaries involved in converting native Patagonians to Christianity. Even though he wrote in English using the Phoenician Roman alphabet we all know and love, I personally can't make anything out of the man's overly flowery handwriting. From what I can make out, there appears to be different terms for a variety of penguin species, such as Gentoo penguins and king penguins. I think the king penguin is called Halaun. I know I'm butchering it. Indigenous terms also exist for rockhopper penguins and what was called the red-eyed penguin, although I'm certain that last species has changed names since Bridges' time. This highlights one of the chief concerns I have about the Internet, and this is sort of a side side thing that's happened to me during this particular surf. We are absolutely flooded with information, just inundated by it. However, in a sense, some of that is really an echo chamber. When it comes to a relatively academic question like, What did native Patagonians call penguins? There's very little information, 
And what little can be found is often repeated and linked back and forth, providing very little substance. From Bridges' dictionary, I can discern that penguins had a lot to do with people's lives down there, using penguins in ceremony as mythological representations, behaving like penguins, walking like penguins, fishing like penguins, all appear to have had their own descriptions that related not only to actual penguin behavior, but also to metaphorical or allegorical descriptions of how people behaved. I'd love, 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 love to discover more about this. The clues I'm digging up here are tantalizing. However, relatively little exists online, at, at least for English speakers like me. This is a shame because as English speakers, our only depictions of penguins involve the ice of Antarctica. We are missing a whole historical dimension here. But the native Patagonian people aren't the only ones interacting with penguins in the land of fire. So I began digging again. I can see that Magellan noted the penguins of this region in 1520. I'd love to know what word Magellan and company used to describe these birds. We know that Francis Drake described them as, quote, penguins in the early 1570s. Other European explorers sailed these waters, established settlements in the region like Nombre de Jesus in 1584. They must have bumped into penguins, eaten them, interacted with them, talked with locals about them. But, you know, I'm coming up with a dead end here. Does not compute. Wikipedia has only the faintest outlines of what I'm researching. In fact, many of the wiki pages for penguins don't have a human history element at all. I think I'm wiping out, Brandon. I think that's what we should call it when we hit a dead end. And that's where I'm at. I'm at a dead end. I I've spinned my wheels in the Wikipedia ecosystem. I've gone to outside sources to get some context and find some descriptions. There's very little to satiate my curiosity. I'm afraid I'm off my board. I'm in the water. So, fellow surfer, what do you think about this? Even as an adult today, I have a hard time, even though I know academically what the difference is between the Arctic and the Antarctic, I am always confusing the two, at least for a split second, um, before catching myself and being like, oh, no, no, there aren't penguins up in the north or all down in the south, these sorts of these sorts of things. And it is kind of funny how is I think that comes from when we're kids and we just kind of imagine these great expanses of ice and that everything should live there. And the fact that it doesn't is a really great um, sort of... Uh, testimony, for lack of a better word, toward uh, the geographical expansion of animals as they evolved and where they hit land bridges, where they hit geographical barriers. The, the fact that there are penguins who live in warm climates is another one of those things that just boggles my mind. I love we live in a world that boggles my mind. It, you know, me too. And like the internet is kind of a symbol of, you know, just having so many interesting tidbits of information at your fingertips. You really can just learn and learn and learn to your heart's content. But am I wrong in assuming that the internet is both a great and a poor source of information? Absolutely. There's so much more information, it sometimes takes a little longer and more effort to comb through to find what you need. Let's just take the topic of the ocean of Wikipedia. This didn't exist um, just a couple years ago. And now pretty much anything anyone has a question about, not just us, you go to Wikipedia and it's generally there. And I can walk away answering pretty much any question I have about anything in a way that just a couple years ago, I couldn't have. I would have always wondered, oh, whatever happened to Fitzroy after he got back from his voyage with Darwin? I would have had to go to a library, look up a book, and, and, and get that information. Now, I pull out my phone, and within 30 seconds, I have an answer. And oftentimes, from Wikipedia, it's an awesome time to be alive. But sometimes hard to sort through the, the uh, flotsam and jetsam of the internet to get to what you needed. That's true. And there are some things that just aren't online. So, if anyone's listening that is a Wikipedia editor or an expert in the cultures of this region, we, we'd like to know more about, you know, what the native Patagonians call these creatures. Surely they call them something. Anyway, that's where I am. I've wiped out, I guess, for a podcast term. Uh, where do we leave off on your travels? Where are you at in the world? I have one last brief surf before I wipe out, and it continues to involve animals. Kyle, if I were to ask you what elephants are afraid of, what would you say? <clears throat> the cartoons I've watched as kids has told me that they're afraid of mice. Correct. Here's another one for you. 
What are the character traits associated with foxes? Oh, uh, that's easy. Foxes are they're sly. They're clever, but mostly sly and sneaky. Correct. So, do you know where these characterizations come from? Oh, no, no clue. Well, now you will. They come from bestiaries. Bestiary. Bestiaries are these lavishly illustrated encyclopedias of animals that first began in the ancient world, but really took off in the Middle Ages. These books would include a physical description of an animal, a list of its characteristics, and a summary of its moral qualities. That last bit should really kind of clue you in to the book's scientific accuracy. Uh, bestiary was not a medieval version of National Geographic. Rather, it was a way to interpret the natural world as an expression of the Christian moral system. So, fascinatingly enough, bestiaries did not differentiate between real animals and mythical ones. Bears, boars, deers, lions, elephants, all of these were mixed in with dragons, unicorns, phoenixes, griffins, and centaurs. We don't really know, like, you know, whether or not the reader of the books knew that these were fantastical creatures, but for those living in the Middle Ages, the authenticity of the creatures wasn't as important as the moral truths they revealed. So, for example, when a bestiary depicted a siren or a mermaid with the upper body of a woman and the lower body of a fish who sang beautiful songs to lure sailors to sleep before attacking and killing them, we are told that the moral of the story is that those who take pleasure in worldly distractions will ultimately be destroyed by the devil. But not all of the creatures are monstrous and ugly. Some of them aren't even bad. For example, we learned that in nature, the pelican would tear open its breast to bring its young to life with its own blood. That's not true, of course, but it was a representation of the way Christ redeemed sinners. These books were made well before the advent of the printing press, mind you, so each of them are beautifully lavished books that had to be copied and illustrated by hand. And most of the illustrations were drawn by artists who'd never even seen these animals in question, and they are depicting them based solely on the physical descriptions, so you really get some interesting-looking beasts. <laughs> like, how, how did you get from beavers to bestiaries? Well, it just so happens that beavers pop up often in bestiaries. They're one of the, the, the primary animals in them, in fact. At the time, beaver testicles were thought to have medicinal properties, and so beavers were generally depicted as biting off their own testicles, which, by the way, is, a, is an impossibility. A beaver's testicles reside inside its body. But they would, they would be depicted biting off their own testicles and throwing them at a hunter as a way to save its life. And the text would then say something along the lines about how uh, a Christian should be more like a beaver and that whoever wants to live a holy life should cut off all of his vices and cast them far away. So that's how. <laughs> and that is the end of today's surf. <laughs> beaver testicles. Somebody had to elevate this material. Too many people were dying. Too many extinctions were going on. I decided to elevate things with beaver testicles. You're welcome. Who thinks this up? Who thinks this up? Wow. That is amazing. Did you come across any vices or virtues for any of the mythological creatures? I did, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, and forgive me, I don't remember the exact story, but there was something about the unicorn and the unicorn's horn, which was uh, representative of Christ's purity, I believe. See, that's interesting to me. Unicorns and the Jesus of Nazareth being linked together through that story. That's... That's surprising. Huh. Any idea when the latest one might have uh, hit the bookshelves? The latest one hit the bookshelves about a year or so ago. It was written by a little-known author named J.K. Rowling. Well, if you ask me, this J.K. Rowling figure is going down a dead end because no one's going to believe this stuff at all. I hope she didn't quit her J. John. <laughs> Welcome to the credits. Latin pronunciation by Annelies Baer. Dutch pronunciation by Corinne van den Heuvel. Celtic pronunciation by Ryan James. Scottish pronunciation by Victoria White. German pronunciation by Liam Adkisson. Spanish pronunciation by Professor Carolina Lorraine. Welsh pronunciation and Drake's Diary, read by Doctor Who's own Yeon Reese. Ockmurder Diary, read by Craig Monroe with Eddie Fernandez as God. And special thanks to Welsh Assembly member Beth Ann Syed, representing the South Wales Rest Region for Plaid Cymru. 
and Smithsonian Folkways recordings for their generous use of their recordings of the chants of the Tierra del Fuego Selknam people. Have you ever heard Benedict Cumberbatch pronounce penguin? Oh, no. That's got to be amazing. It, you have to go check it out, uh, uh, dear re- uh, listeners. Uh, yeah, he pronounces penguin penguin. And they, on, they he caught penguin? He says penguin. Oh. Which which it almost sounds like he's pronouncing it closer to how it should be pronounced than than how we pronounce it. So uh, I'll just leave that to uh, to our dear listeners to see if Benedict Cumberbatch is once again smarter than the rest of us.